Cyberwork is celebrating its next major milestone. As of July 2020, Cyberwork has had over a quarter of a million listeners. We're so grateful to all of you that have watched the videos on our YouTube page, commented on live release feeds, left ratings and reviews on your favorite podcast platform, redeemed bonus offers, or just listened in the comfort of your own home. Thank you to all of you. Because our listenership is growing so quickly and because Cyberwork has big plans for the second half of 2020 and beyond, we want to make sure that we're giving you what you want to hear. That's right, we want to hear specifically from you. So please go to www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. That's www and the numeral two, www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. The survey is just a few questions and it won't take you that long, but it will really help us to know where you are in your cybersecurity career and what topics and types of information you enjoy hearing on this podcast. Again, that's www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. Uh, please respond today and you could be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. That's www.infosecinstitute.com slash survey. Thanks once again for listening. And now on with the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week I sit down with a different industry thought leader and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Our guest today, Gabe Gums, is the Chief Innovation Officer at Spiron. He came to the program with some very intriguing discussion topics, one particularly slanted to a common theme on the show. Gabe wanted to tell us about, quote, the skills gap that wasn't, as well as some updates on data privacy and the wake of GDPR and CCPA, and some ways that you can make data privacy a profession to live with. Gabe Gums has a deep-rooted passion for technology, information security, and problem-solving. As Chief Innovation Officer at Spiron, uh, a leader in rapid identification and protection of sensitive data, he's channeling that passion to make the digital world a safer place. By spearheading Spiron's uh, vision for data privacy in the next decade and beyond, he's leading the way to a more secure and private future for all. Gabe, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chris. A pleasure. Okay, I just realized that I, I misspelled, uh, is it Spirion or Spiron? Spirion. Spirion, my apologies. No Oops. worries. Check out Spirion. Uh, okay, so uh, before we talk about data privacy, we always like to start out by finding a little bit about our guests. So how did you first get interested in this field? Have, have computers and tech always been part of your background or did you move into it later in your career? No, it's always been part of my background. So okay. uh, early on in, in kind of my, well, pre Security days. I was uh, I was dabbling in in many different types of of technology. So, um, I uh, I got involved with my local NY uh, lug group many moons ago. So mm -hmm. a, a Linux user group meetup, um, and uh, you know things of that nature. And it was also kind of around the same time uh, the twenty six hundred scene was kind of growing up a bit more in the New York mm. City area. And so I've always kind of been involved in, interested in kind of around it to some degree. And the early part of my career actually was in networking. And, okay. uh, and from there, I, before, before uh, I'd taken on my first InfoSec position, uh, I had already been in, in technology as well too. So it's been, a, it's been a long love affair with technology and security. Okay. So was there a particular sort of defining event or something where you were doing networking and you're like, oh, I like, I like security better. You know, this is more interesting to me. Was there some particular thing where you're like, oh, this is what I want to do? Yeah. Well, I was kind of experimenting with things kind of in my own personal time from okay. a security perspective and, and, you know, just kind of testing things out and breaking things and building things, et cetera. And so that, that interest was there. Uh, it wasn't until an actual opportunity presented itself in the workplace um, where I was at the time as, as a network engineer that allowed me to move into it in a bit more of a professional capacity. Okay. Um, so tell me about your job at, at Spirion. What exactly does the average workday of a chief innovation officer look like? Well, it, means you spend a lot of time in problem space and talking to other people about their problems. Luckily, it's okay. not really on the couch type of problems, although for, for many of them, it can be. <laughs> yeah, one leads to the other. Indeed. Uh, but I spent a lot of time trying to understand what the challenges are that organizations face around data privacy and data security and how what technology sphere and builds we can leverage to alleviate those problems and eliminate mm. them in some cases. Uh, so, you know, a large part of my day spent around building the overall product strategy for the larger portfolio. Okay. Uh, 
what are we building? Why are we building it? Who are we building it for? Right. Uh, things of that nature. So yeah, a lot of it is spent talking to actual practitioners on the ground again with with their problem, um, and then with my own internal teams. We've got uh, you know, we've got a product management team and an engineering team and a research and development team. Um, and you know we 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 take all of these ideas that we come up. We do some market research as well. We test things. We prototype. We prototype some ideas, and uh, we get into the hands of customers and see how it, it actually solves problems in the real world. And, uh, and then we turn those things into product. Okay. Um, do you, do you have sort of, uh, direct reports? Do you, do you, um, sort of actively manage, you, you know, your various teams? Indeed. Yeah. So there's an entire innovation team that, uh, okay. that actively manage. And, and so there's kind of two arms that if you would, there is more of the, the academic research side of it. Okay. And then there is the, the very hands-on technical side of the research right. as well. Okay. And um, do, have you had any particular, like, you know, we're, we're trying to get a sense of like how security managers are sort of taking care of their team at a point where everything is so sort of distant and work from home and there's not a lot of sort of face-to-face -face collaboration with COVID-19 and so forth. Um, have your sort of management uh, strategies have to, had to change at all now that everyone's sort of, you know, off in their, in their own individual, um, you know, mm. cone of silence? It's a little from column A and a little from column B. So I'm okay. an old grizzly work from home veteran. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, pretty, uh, prior to taking the, my current position, I actually worked from home for the last 15 or so years. Um, so for me personally, you know, working remotely and managing remote teams um, did not pose the same type of challenge. Um, in you, you know my current role at the, the head of the innovation strategy table, uh, we had we had a very office centric environment um, pre COVID, and a lot of that was just around you know rapidly um, coming up with ideas, testing them, and so forth. And, and a lot of those things happened very organically in person, a lot of whiteboarding and things of that nature. I'd say that's really the only thing that was heavily impacted was mm -hmm. maybe the whiteboarding of it. That, that exchange of ideas still happens. It, it really meant that we had to we had to leverage more technology platforms to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, where, where we would in the past get up and, and, you know, maybe go talk to someone really quickly. You know, you know, we, we use, uh, we use some chat technologies to, to mm -hmm. kind of do the same. So, um, you know, for I, again, for for myself and and for for those within you know my my direct uh, orbit, not a massive change, not okay. a massive change at all. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you know, a lot of our listeners, the the main slant of cyber cyber work is that you know our listeners are working out what type of careers they want to enter. So I, I wanted to sort of atomize you know some of the career steps that you took to get to the position you're at now. What types of positions, experiences, skills, learning did you need to do to become a chief innovation officer? What were some of the sort of past, you know, signposts? Yeah, well, it, it certainly was a circuitous route. That is to say, I didn't wake up one morning any number of years ago and say that's where I want to be specific. Okay. Um, although, you know, it was it was in the general arena, if you would. Okay. But in terms of, of getting to that place, a large part of my, uh, I'd say that three quarters of my, my career path was very much on the practitioner side of, mm -hmm. of the house. So that is to say, I was actively um, putting together security programs and, and coming together with security solutions to solve problems directly for the business. So in this capacity, it's it's I take a lot of the, the skills learned from there and kind of blow it out to do it on a larger scale for for you know numerous organizations, hundreds of them, um, thousands re re really you know at that scale. And so some of the things that really helped me along the way was uh, a very a very early understanding of, of technology and its interconnection point. So I, I don't know that everyone needs to necessarily, you know, know the, the, the different layers of the OSI model, but it's helpful. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that everyone needs to, to know how to program, but I certainly advocate for it. Um, and so, you know, picking up those types of, of deep technology skill sets along the way, along with um, some more of just the managerial skill sets, you know, by the time you, you, you're talking about, you know, my existing position um, is very helpful. But, uh, you know, I, I still spend a lot of time learning, a lot of time learning. And I think not so much what, what the steps were to get here so much as it is the steps to to be good at what one does when they're there right and that does require constant learning so you know okay. programming for example so mm -hmm. i've been i've been getting my hands dirty in, in learning golang for example mm -hmm. um i'm actually really enjoying that 
try to think. Uh, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with, we've got uh, a number of data scientists uh, on the team. And, and so there's some new concepts and theories there that I've spent the last two years really getting very deep into and understanding how how they operate, you know, how adversarial net net networks are are created and, and those different types of, of ML models are built, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I think the, the easy, the easy, the, the short answer is regardless of where you want to end up, I think it has to be a, a, a passion so much so that you have to enjoy getting really deep into the study of it as opposed to just the practice of it. But there does need to be a healthy, healthy balance of both the sure. study and the practice. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk, can you talk a little bit about sort of ongoing learning and what, you know, you say you're, you're working on some new, uh, you know, languages and so forth, but like what, uh, sort of tell me about your, your sort of like your learning preferred methods. Do you, I mean, what, what do you do? Do you use books? Do you do labs online? Do you like, you know, take active courses of study? Do you just sort of like thumb through things after dinner? Like, you know, what, how do, how do you sort of keep your, your, your skill set fresh? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> yes. All of those. Okay. So Try everything. Uh, yeah, so I'm 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 I do still enjoy some some dead trees once in a while, and so yeah. last week, for example, I was on vacation and I took my rather thick I don't know it's four hundred or so page uh, you know GoLang book with me. Okay. Um, I also uh, I do I do leverage things like uh, Coursera and, and and other online learning platforms, and and uh, I probably spend a few hours in those every week. Um, I do a, a, a lot of just reading of, of academic papers as well too. Uh, a, a lot of interacting with others in and around my field too. So not necessarily those just in uh, the, the product strategy and innovation side of the house, but those directly in the, in, in the, in the depths of, of security mm-hmm. and, and privacy. So I actually spend a lot of time in some of the, the community Slack channels. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I spend a lot of time like trusted public set channel and things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and, and for me, those are some of the more important places to, to really learn from because there are other human beings discussing uh, the challenges they have and the solutions that, that they're, right. they're exploring for these problems. Okay. Um, so have, do you have any um, certifications in your background? Do you have any sort of thoughts on, on, on getting certs? Do you have any particular ones that you sort of require from your, you know, your team and so forth? So required, not necessarily. It, okay. it, it, it kind of depends. I, I take a, but my approach to building teams out is usually kind of balancing out the, the overall skill sets across the team. Not necessarily everyone must have a CISSP kind of Got thing. Um, mm-hmm. That said, though, interestingly, the, the entire team this, this, uh, this quarter is challenged to, to uh, pick a sort of, of their choice and, and explore actually getting it. So for myself, again, I like a lot of hands-on um, type of stuff. So the last mm. active cert I had was the GWAPT, okay. which is uh, it's the GIAC's um, web application penetration testing uh, certification. So yeah, it's a very hands-on certification that tests one skill set in application security. Um, I am currently uh, seeking, uh, so I'm, I'm studying for uh, a couple of the IAPP certifications. Hmm. Those are more privacy oriented. Got Some it. folks in the team are working towards their CEH, the Certified Ethical uh, Hacker Certification. Mm-hmm. So I would, I'd steer folks more towards kind of what their needs are from a professional um, right. standpoint. If you're looking to enter into security, then, you know, kind of minimum bar to entry. A lot of folks are going to be looking for a CISP or something similar, right? Mm. That's just kind of your, your barrier to entry for a lot of folks. Okay. Um, but from there, I, I think uh, one should try to search that, that act, actually can demonstrate your, your mastery of, of the topic, I right. think is good because there are, I'm not going to call any out, but I think there are some certs that are, you know, study the book a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, and you've got yourself a cert kind of thing right. versus yeah. versus being able to demonstrate, ah, I understand this topic well enough that I can apply it. Right, uh, right, right. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, I mean, that's good. And, you know, it's it's important to not think of certs as, as trading cards or, you know, things to collect, but as things that, you know, tools that can solve problems and so forth. So, um yeah. yeah, I did a quick, quick uh, anecdotal story. So I'm, I'm sitting in someone's office. This is easily seven or eight years ago. Okay. And there's a wall of certs. And when I say a wall of certs, without exaggeration, there's probably 30 of them, like easy. Yeah. 
and yeah, I was all, all, fra- all framed and everything. All framed and everything. Yeah. I was more fascinated and impressed, yeah. about honestly, and sure. and impressed. And and one of them caught my eye, and so I asked the question, "How how'd you get that, sir?" And the response was, with a very deadpan look on, on their face, "Well, I studied for it." It's like, oh well, of course. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah. It, it, and it was at that moment it occurred to me, it was like, <laughs> so. So that's so that, that's the wall. Like it's I I picked up the book. Yeah, I grabbed the material. I got proof the of con- proof of concept. I studied. Yeah. I took the test. I, yeah, I, I now have the skill of taking I, that I, test. Right, <laughs> <laughs> and I realize I should probably not inquire any further about the other. Right two dozen plus certs. <laughs> yeah. I, and I guess I, I mostly asked too, because, you know, we, we get a lot of different type of guests on the show and, and some will say, yeah, certs are really important or I recommend this one or this one. And other people will say certs are completely unimportant just as long as you can, you know, do the task, you know, we don't really care what your resume looks like and so forth. So it's always interesting to hear sort of, you know, where different people stand on, on the use or application or necessity of them. I'm somewhere down the middle on that one. It, okay. It's a big fat old, it depends. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 Again, it, 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 it's a tool. And, it, and if, you, if you need the tool in your toolbox, you better have it. There it is. Uh, so in the talks before the program, we came up with a, a nice combo of topics to discuss today. So uh, we're going to move around a little bit throughout the show. It's not just one thing. But, um, you know, we've had a couple of guests on here talk about uh, GDPR and CCPA and uh, the topic certainly bears repeating. Uh, so the area you specifically wanted to discuss was the right to be forgotten, uh, in which organizations that collect data as part of their regular transactions uh, with clients or customers must have a strong system in place to safely remove the data, you know, after it served its purpose. So what are, what are your thoughts on the difficulty or, uh, you know, newsworthiness of this provision? Well, I think you touched on it in the last, in the last bit of that sentence, after it served its purpose. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the word purpose is explicitly defined in GDPR. Yes. And it is defined as the reason which you you collected that information in the first place. And you're only allowed to process that information based on the purpose that you expressed to the data subject when you got it, which basically says, so, so Chris, when you, when you went to, you know, www.amazon.com and you provided me with your home address and your phone number and your credit card, et cetera, um, you provided that to me for the purpose of becoming a customer so I can fulfill your orders. Mm -hmm. And so I'm only allowed to process the information in that way. There's some provisions also once you sign up for the platform that also say explicitly like, hey, we're going to use this information, for example, to understand how people like Chris, uh, how they how they shop, what their purchasing habits are, right. what their likes and dislikes are. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another purpose. Now, the second you stop being a customer of Amazon, um, you know, under th- these provisions, you ostensibly have the right to say, I no longer want you using, you know, that information that you collected on me for anything outside of those purposes. Right. But Amazon, of course, still wants to be able to, to market to people like Chris. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the many challenges, right. Of, of the right to be forgotten from the business aspect. It's that data is extremely valuable. That data is necessary for me to process for my business to exist and to grow. I don't exist to process that data. I process that data to, to exist and to grow. So, so, how do I forget about you while still being able to learn about people like you? So that's one challenge. And there are some, there are some answers to that challenge. Okay. There's some, yeah, there, there are some ways that, that it can be accomplished. Um, you know, differential privacy methods come to mind. So the first is you pseudonymize or anonymize the data sets so that I can extract knowledge about the person without re- without retaining any direct identifiable or, in, or indirectly identifiable okay. knowledge about the person. You're scrubbing, you're scrubbing my name and identifiers. Yeah. You're, just, but you're, really, what you're, you're just sort of keeping like the demographic data of what I bought. Which yes, mm-hmm. but that too, again, still has its own challenges. There are sure. different privacy attacks against data sets where I can re-identify individuals, right? Sure. If the data set is uh, small enough or limited enough or not diverse enough, it becomes easy for me to know for example, if uh, you know there, you, you live, let's say, within a metropolitan area, and you live in a con- condominium building, and there's a hundred people, um, and uh, and I retain, say, uh, information about um, your you know your uh, your sex, male or female. Well, that already eliminates some percentage of the individuals within that building. So I start narrowing down who it can be, and then Got I start it. narrowing down if I if I retain, you know, say your your age, not just a, a range, but 
explicitly your age. I've, mm -hmm. I've narrowed it down maybe even further at that point. Um, and then as, as you start looking at the individual identifiers of any subject, it, it is very difficult to, uh, to, to be able to, to apply the appropriate cures to data while also still forgetting about that individual. It's not wholly impossible by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Um, but it is, it is challenging. And then there's also the, the, uh, the kind of paradox of, well, how do I ensure that information anywhere else within the organization was a all found and re remediated. So I found every single instance of all of Chris's information and I have scrubbed all of it and or deleted all of it. And if I didn't, how do I know when it resurfaces, when I finally mm. do find it, if I was supposed to have forgotten about you? Right. right. That, the second half of that is is really the bigger problem, because if I don't retain some information about you, then I would know that it, it was still around to for me to have violated it. So it means I have to first find all of it. Right. Yeah. Um, so there, there are there are no shortage of challenges with the right to be forgotten. Okay, now our, you know, you, you've, you've laid out the problem pretty well here. Do you have um, sort of a similarly laid out like solution that's not being implemented right now that you think, you know, would take care of this problem? Uh, I don't know about not being implemented. I think it's more about how it's being implemented, right? Okay. So it's the larger implementation throughout the entire data life cycle. Yes. Um, you know, so again, a lot of what I try to do is, is solve for the the entirety of the problem and, and put into place not just a one point of a solution or, or one point of an answer, but, but, but look at it throughout that entire life, life cycle. So from the time that information is first captured, am I gathering enough information to know what type of information it was and what purpose it was that I was capturing? It? And then as that information is used, shared, processed, analyzed, do I also now have the appropriate controls in place to respect both consent and compliance and security while it's being used? And then finally, once I get to archival and destruction, again, do I have the right policies, procedures, and controls in place to do those things as well? So uh, the, the well laid out answer is along, you have to look at each step within the life cycle of data from the time it's created used, shared, archived, destroyed, and apply the appropriate control throughout each of those points of the life cycle. So the answer is I see today a lot of controls being applied to maybe one point in that life cycle, right? So some folks may take some additional measures when they first gather that data, when they first start processing it, right. and then maybe not take the same level of care um, in the middle stages as it's being used and shared, which then starts doing things like violating consent on the GDPR and other things of that nature. If you get to GDPR too, like you know, we've had HIPAA in place since uh, 95, right? That sounds right. Um, yeah. And so HIPAA has had a similar notion for decades too, right? You, we share a lot of health information for the purpose of, of understanding, um, you know, how, how to treat different ailments and, and uh, things of that nature. I mean, in, in this COVID environment, we're doing a whole lot of health sharing uh, right now right. as well, too, right? For, for research purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, fa yeah. Fast and sort of desperate sharing. Fast and desperate sharing. So are those right measures in place, right? right. And so the, a lot of those things aren't even new concepts, much less uh, new new calls for, for remediating that data. In fact, HIPAA had explicitly defined the proper way to de-identify data many moons ago. And mm. the level by which their definition of de-identifying the data does differ um, than, say, FERPA, for example, right? Okay. Um, so the, 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 the answer to your question is, the well laid out way to implement it today is to ensure that you're looking at data throughout every stage of the life cycle and applying okay. the appropriate control. Okay. So, I mean, I, I guess I, what I'm also trying to get to is based on laws like GDPR and CCPA uh, is, is the sort of language and the, the law sufficient to sort of get us to that. And, and is the reason that it's not being done more a matter of people either intentionally or unintentionally sort of uh, skirting the, you know, the regulations such as they are. I guess I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get a sense of what the, you know, what the point of friction is here. Well, there are several points of friction and you asked, uh, you know, what not the letter of the law does. Well, right. CCPA certainly does not even explicitly state 
what a good mechanism for, uh, or, or what the minimum bar to entry for de-identification, nominalization, um, you know, data, scrubbing, sharing, et cetera, is it doesn't explicitly state, this is what you need to do to make sure that subject data is well de-identified, the same way, say, HIPAA does. Um, GDPR does go a little bit further and do so. However, GDPR equally takes a very wide approach to what is subject data, and it's defined as directly or indirectly identifiable. So the EMI number in your SIM card in your phone is something that's indirectly identifiable to Chris. And so even something like that, uh, you have to, to figure out how to make sure that if, if that's data that you collect and share, et cetera, um, how that is being uh, properly handled. Um, hmm. And then some other friction points is really just a, a big knowledge gap. We, we've moved fast and hard on CCPA, for example. Yeah, yeah that's a fast rollout. Very fast. So folks still try to understand the intricacies, the nuances. And then, of course, n- very few of the provisions have been challenged um, in a legal setting. So, you know, there is no precedent for, for a lot of those things. So, um, yeah, that we've got a ways to go before it all becomes very prescriptive for anyone to just wake up one morning and go, ah, I know how to do this. Right. Okay. So we're all still learning as we go here at this point. There's certainly a lot of learning still left to be done, although there's a lot we do know, and we should certainly take all of those measures right now. As right. I mentioned, you make sure you're handing, handling data based on its, its, its preference, its process, its purpose, uh, but that we do have a ways to go. Do you see uh, general improvements based on the, the rollouts of these things? I mean, obviously, there are still problems, and, and you said problems of implementation and stuff, but you know, it, it seems like it was pretty of a pretty lawless non-system we had for years there do you do you feel like that there's there's some sort of like you know order happening around all that chaos it, it i feel like it is getting better every day okay yeah, it's getting better every day it's, it's it's certainly a whole lot of one foot in front of the other but, yeah um, <laughs> right right but right. I, but i don't see us going backwards at least okay. not right now <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's important to, you know, sort of understand the distinction between the sort of like conniving, like, Ooh, I'm going to take this data and do something nefarious with it versus people like it's my first day on the job. I didn't yeah. even know. You know. Right. Like I know, yeah. no one told me that was unacceptable. <laughs> right. So uh, speaking of, of sort of like the job aspect of it, uh, you know, obviously with these new laws taking effect and potentially opening up, you know, new responsibilities for enterprises of all shapes and sizes, are there any new type of careers or positions that might be on the increase due to the regulations with GPR, CCPA, and other sort of regulations like this? Well, there's certainly an opportunity for those that understand the law and technology um, to, uh, to, to really make really strong impacts in, in our world. There okay. are not many of them. Um, certainly not many that, that I've met with, with a firm grasp of, again, both the technology and, and the law. So there's, there is, uh, there, there's very much those opportunities. Um, and some of those uh, come into shape and form of, of data privacy officers and you know, titles such as those. Um, those things exist. There is, in my both professional and personal opinion, uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunities for, for, analyst positions. That is to say, you know, today we're in the security world, we've got a lot of SOC positions, right? We've got SOC yes. analysts, level one, level two, level three analysts. Yep. The nature of their job around understanding security risk is now also coupled with being able to understand a privacy risk. So what's the difference? Well, let's say you have an alert that uh, uh, some data is, uh, has been, has it, has left the company, right? It's been, you see it, you see it crossing one of your data loss prevention technologies. You, you, you see it leaving an egress point, et cetera. And you just don't want anything to leave. Well, that's, that certainly is problematic from a security perspective. Um, you also have now privacy challenges of Gabe has now explicitly requested that you no longer share his data with a third party. Mm-hmm. So even though you may have a legitimate connection to a third party where you share this information digitally, and no security violations may have occurred there. There certainly is a privacy violation when you share my data and you weren't supposed to. A very real one really, where you will also be fined and subject to, to lawsuits, et cetera, by doing so. So we need to be able to, to uh, automate and orchestrate and understand when an alert such as that triggers, right? So what does that mean? Um, it means we need to be able to have privacy operations as part of our larger um, uh, uh, functions within an organization. And so privacy operations, I, I see equally as, as another opportunity for, for new types of, of 
roles within organizations. Um, and, and maybe what we do is we, we grow and expand out the security operations role into the privacy operations role, or we combine them. And so, you know, we, we take privacy and we put it right into the middle of our, our, our security operations center. And we go from, from security operations centers to security and privacy operations centers, right? So from a SOC mm-hmm. to a SPOC, if you would, um, long live the data, right? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> uh, so I, I see a lot of opportunities on that front. Okay. Um, so, um, sorry, I, uh, I just got a weird Zoom message here. Um, so, uh, we talk a lot on this podcast about the skills gap in cybersecurity, you know, uh, basically that there's this great disparity between the number of available cybersecurity positions open, uh, which is a lot, and the number of qualified positions to do them, which is uh, not a lot. Uh, so, in our discussion, you mentioned the, cyber, the security skills shortage that wasn't, suggesting that you might have some views about the topic that might run counter to popular opinion. So, uh, what, in your opinion, is the future of cybersecurity jobs versus the available workforce? Well, let's take those uh, privacy operations that I just mentioned because you okay. can't have yeah you can't have privacy without security. So they're they're certainly going to be hand in hand, if not uh, completely um, morphed into one. Right. So if we can't fill the security roles today, how do we ever plan on filling the privacy roles that are that are now that that we're now faced with? The, the answer is you're not. And, hmm. But from my perspective, I don't think there was ever really a shortage of human beings. I think we had two major problems. The first is. For far too long, um, my fellow practitioners have made security way too esoteric of a topic that just scared too many people off, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God, it's the dark arts. I don't, I do not know how, how I'm supposed to en- enter this, right? Like, like we're all walking around with the mark of the dark one on, on, on our forearm. That's <laughs> not right, a thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and the second is that the technologies did not allow us to scale what resources we did have. So we we see some of that getting better with um, security orchestration and automation um, and remediation solutions, right? Where we're able to rapidly not just alert on things, but orchestrate responses to things that gets us into a better mechanism for triaging. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to close this perceived skill shortage. Because again, I don't think it's an actual skill shortage. I think it's a technology issue. I think we haven't built systems that have allowed us to orchestrate, automate, respond, and scale out our our needs nearly well enough. Um, because there's just no way that we would have ever been able to have put enough warm bodies in in the seats. Right. Yeah. So I think we were we we first start by removing the this veil and this cloak of of this is some big esoteric thing, and then we also start building better technologies that allows, especially at the entry levels too, right? Mm, the entry yes. levels it allows for far more folks to be able to simply enter into those uh, those roles, and that's largely a technology problem. Right. Okay. So. Um... Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good point. That, that that is definitely the sort of like the hard point of the funnel is getting getting the sort of beginner beginner people in there and stuff like that. Right. So do you do you have any any more any more thoughts on that? Like, um, you know, obviously that, that that's the problem. But what's what's what, where where do we where do we sort of like change things? We could start by lowering some of the requirements, right? Don't yes. don't ask for someone to have ten years of Kubernetes experience when it's only been around for six. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it seems like an awful lot of guests have said that. Yeah, the 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 sort of like the HR requirements are one of the big sort of choke points. That it, it's it's certainly a choke point, right? Like, yeah. and, and again, back to the certification ones. Is it really mandatory for someone to have a CISSP, right? Like, is it right. really? I don't. I don't think so. Like, you, you can take a. You certainly can take a, a first year mechanical engineering student and teach that that person. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the skills they need, and or that person could teach themselves, and or they could take some secondary school to 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 get what they need. Things that would be applicable to to the positions they're they're applying for. So that's one. Um, and again, the other one is by definitely orchestrating and automating uh, way more of the task. We, we've done a better job of automating. Um, mm. We've got a ways to go on the orchestration of, okay. of, uh, of our technologies in general. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess as we sort of wrap up today, where do you see data privacy going in the next five to 10 years, especially with, with more regulations coming on board and more sort of, uh, you know, options for, um, you know, enforcing these things? Like where, what, what do you see the landscape looking like in the, in the next decade? Well, the technology landscape, I think that the trajectory of that one will have to, to start 
leveling out a bit. So, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully see a lot of consolidation in, in the privacy technology stack. Uh, so th there's, there's one area that I certainly see that going into today. A lot of folks try to solve for just one problem that they've identified. And so there's mm. a lot of solutions that, that have sprung up to solve those one problems. So we'll start seeing more consolidation of that. But I also see, again, I, I see the convergence of security and privacy um, for, for the same reasons I've mentioned uh, in, on the show, which is, you know, you can't have privacy without security. You can have security right. without privacy, but not the other way around. Mm. And so I see more of a convergence of the two as well, both in the, in the business functions, mm -hmm. as well as in the, in the technology functions. Um, those, I see those things being inextricably linked and I see, and I see all of this still starting where even security has, which is in just understanding the data. We will be incapable of protecting it if we don't know what it is. And yes. we will become even less capable of preserving its privacy if we don't know what it is. Even if we manage to protect it, whereby protect big air quotes means, you know, I've, yeah. I've, I've uh, you know, I've, I've put it under lock and key. But if the persons with the keys are people that should not have access to it, then I've also violated privacy. So gotcha. we need to understand what it is as well, too. Okay. Uh, so as we wrap up today, uh, tell me a little more about Spirion and some of the projects you currently have in the works. Yeah. So Spirion's a data security and privacy company. Been around for the better part of uh, over a decade and a half. Um, we're, we're headquartered down in, in sunny St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. And uh, so, you know, a number of things that, that we've gotten a rise in are, are very similar to some of the things we've talked about today, which is helping organizations protect that, that data. So protecting the security and the privacy of it, helping them be able to respond to data subject access requests, helping them be able to discover, classify, apply appropriate controls to, to their data sets. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a number of things in the works, including, um, you know, being able to, to offer some, some additional uh, analytics and governance uh, solutions to those larger data privacy and security products. So we've rolled out two of those things earlier this year. We've got a few more that we'll be announcing um, just in the next couple of months. So uh, certainly looking forward to those things uh, being released and, and you know, folks checking them out. And uh, you guys can head on over to www.spirin.com and, and take a poke around. Um, okay. We've also got I R I O N. Is that right? Yep. S P I R O N. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, we also have a, a little podcast that we do also called oh. Privacy Please Podcast. So Privacy Please. Um, okay. Yeah, privacy, please. Pie. It's all, all very focused on data security, privacy, and uh, and you know I'm active on Twitter at Gabriel Gums. If anyone wants to uh, give me a shout, um, and yeah, you, you can find us in all those locations. Okay, uh, Gabe, thank you for joining us today on Cyberwork. This was really interesting, and uh, and I, I really enjoyed hearing about uh, uh, all these sort of things that I have this sort of vague knowledge of and uh, are changing every day. So thank you. I thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Okay, and thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice, and please rate and review us if you have a moment. Uh, for a free month of the InfoSec Skills platform that you saw in the little video at the start of today's show, uh, and, uh, go to infosecinstitute.com slash skills, sign up for an account, and in the coupon line type the word cyberwork, all one word, all small letters, no spaces, and get your free month. Thank you once again to Gabe Gums and Spirion, and thank you all for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week.